Okay, our next speaker is David Jones. Dr. David Jones is the Associate Director of the University of California Pavement Research Center in Davis, California. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a quick update on where the NCHRP 9-62 project is, um, and that's the rapid tests and specifications for construction of asphalt-treated cold recycled materials. Okay, I hope you're all still awake, and I uh, hope uh, that I'll be able to keep you awake. Uh, during this presentation, Steve said, you know, he, uh, he has an accent issue, then I certainly have an accent issue. <laughs> yeah, when I first came to the States, I thought that Americans listened badly. Uh, then I realized, no, it's me that uh, speaks badly, so uh, bear with me, and, uh, and I'll, if you need translation, then, uh, then let me know. Okay, the, the project team, Brian Diefenderfer from Virgin, Virginia Transportation Research Council, he's the PI for the study. We, uh, we teamed up with them, so uh, I'm the co-PI of the study from, from UC Pavement Research Center. We have Adam Hand, he used to be the quality director for Granite Construction, he's now at University of Nevada, Reno. Um, he's part of the team. We have Benjamin Bowers, um, he's now at Auburn University, but when we started the project he was still at uh, uh, Virginia Transportation Research Council. We have Ilka Buzz, um, also from VTRC, and then Gerardo Flinch from uh, Virginia Tech. And then we also have a kind of like oversight committee made up of members of, of industry primarily uh, that's kind of go-to for, uh, for getting information from, from what's in practice. Okay, quick outline of the presentation, basically give you some objectives on the background. We'll take a look at through phase one, that's, that's already finished, um, focusing on the literature review, the spec review, stakeholder survey and, and the work plan that we put together to start with phase two. I'll go into phase two, we haven't been at it that long, um, but just run through some of the tests that we're looking at. And then we often get criticized that we're doing a lot of work in California, but we don't share it. Uh, Steve's, he, he's a big critic there <laughs> saying, we should be sharing more about what we're saying. So if I've got some time at the end of the presentation, I'll just run through some of the things that we're doing. Because we, we are actually doing some pretty cool work out there, but uh, we're better researchers. We, we do better research than, than we do um, telling people about the research that we actually do. Okay, so the objectives of the study uh, develop time critical tests uh, for asphalt treated um, partial depth and full depth reclaimed materials and partial depth covering cold in place recycling and the coal central plant uh, recycling. And the deliverable from that pre uh, prepare guide specifications for using those tests for process control and um, product acceptance. So basically everything's being driven by density and moisture content agencies concerned that that's not actually telling us what these, uh, what these materials are doing right now and what they're likely to do in the future. And so really what the agencies are looking for in a nutshell is saying when can we open it to traffic without affecting that layer uh, because most of the time we are trafficking it, as Steve said, we're trafficking it before we put the asphalt surfacing on it and then the next question is, is, when, when, is this, when is the right time to, to put the surfacing on that? I'm not going to sell the, the benefits to you of in-place recycling. I think we're all aware of those. They're well documented, both from an economic and an environmental point of view. Um, and we know from long-term experience that we can get really good performance out of these materials. One of the things that keeps coming out of this, though, is that there is a lack of rapid process control and acceptance tests. We know that these materials are different. Um, you know, some of it, you know, there's still a lot of people that try and box it into hot mix asphalt. They're saying we're doing, instead of doing a mill and full, we're doing a cold in place um, recycle. Therefore, it's got to be the same as the full part of that mill and full. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not HMA. And if you try and make it HMA, then all you're going to get is a really bad HMA. You're going to get a bad grading we tend to be running at half the oil content that you would in an HMA, um, so we're just going to get really bad HMA. So forget about the HMA. Uh, it works differently, it behaves differently, it's designed differently. Let's embrace that and accept it as a new material. The other problem is, is uh, again, uh, Steve alluded to that, um, was this misunderstanding about the stabilization and the role of the active filler. Um, and we get people, you know, because we add asphalt and a little bit of cement or lime or, or some other active filler, then people are trying to box it into, well, is this asphalt stabilization or is it cement stabilization? Is it performing like asphalt or is it performing like cement? Uh, and I kind of fail to grasp why people can't just accept that we can have an, a new stabilizer. It's a hybrid stabilizer. It performs completely different to either of those two materials, so, so why try and box it into one of the others? You know, there's no rule written anywhere 
that says we can't have a third stabilizer out there. Just like there's no rule that we can't have another pavement layer material. It doesn't have to be cement stabilized. It doesn't have to be hot mix asphalt. So once we get over that, then I think we can, uh, we can start heading in the right direction. Key questions basically coming out of that is how does the contract uh, rapidly demonstrate that the material meets that agency intent? Okay, so a lot of the agencies don't know what that intent is, but even more difficult for the contractors to work out what it is and are they meeting it? And how does the agency actually accept it and say, yeah, I'm good with this, I'm, I'm happy to pay for it? In terms of the study, you're looking at two recycling strategies. So again, what we're calling partial depth reclaim materials and full depth reclaim materials with a partial depth cold in place recycling and the cold and central plant recycling. The study, by the terms of reference, uh, was limited to asphalt stabilizing materials only. So if we're stabilizing with cement only, that is not included in the study and we were expressly told not to include it in there. So we're looking at both foamed and emulsified asphalt and then looking at cement and lime as the active fillers. There are a lot of other active fillers being used out there but in fairly small quantities. Uh, so we restricted the study with the approval of the panel uh, to look at just lime and, and cement. All right, so partial depth, uh, Steve went into this. So primarily top-down distresses uh, within, the ash within the existing asphalt layers, uh, typically around about two to five inches thick. Uh, the coal central plant recycling, mobile plants, so mill it off, take it to a mobile <coughs> plant close to the project, process it, take it back, put it down with a, with a paver. Um, you can do it with any layer. Uh, you can take the layers off, stabilize the subgrade, bring those layers back, all that sort of thing. Layers typically four to six inches thick, the individual layers are. Uh, we have been involved in projects where we have multiple layers of the, um, of the recycled material. And then the full depth reclamation, primarily for dealing with bottom-up distresses, essentially creates a new stabilized base, uh, typically six, six to 12 inches thick. I've been on projects that have gone down to 18. Um, I think that's ridiculous, um, but unfortunately there are some, some folks still doing that. Moving into the project phases, um, phase one, which is complete, um, there is an interim report out, um, and that was accepted by the panel. Uh, that looked at the literature review, spec review, stakeholder survey, and uh, we had to develop the work plan for phase two. Phase two is in progress. Um, that's the development and bench testing of potential QCQA tests. So essentially doing it under really controlled conditions and looking at all sorts of uh, various things based on the information that we've got out there so far. And then phase three, obviously haven't started that, although we are doing a little bit of it in terms of, uh, of, of in conjunction with phase two, but that's essentially field validation of the tests that we develop um, and then writing those up into formal language and, and example specification language. So adding to what already, um, what Arrow's already been, uh, been doing. Let's take a look at phase one quickly. Uh, so started off that with a literature review, typical thing, you know, looked at anything we could get hold of from agency documentation, journal papers, conference papers, um, the Arrow guidelines, all, all of those sorts of things. Basically what we were finding out of it, uh, at kind of what we expected, but it was uh, improving in that document that pretty much everything is being driven right now by density and moisture content, what you can do with a new gauge. Limited research and, rec and, and information on stiffness change. Because stiffness change is essentially driving uh, mechanistic design, some folks, some agencies going out there and doing some FWD testing after, the, after construction get an idea of how stiffness changes over time, and then a bunch of other uh, performance-based tests which I'll, which I'll go into. Probably one of the better um, work or documents that we found uh, was a series of research studies undertaken by Utah Department of Transportation where they were looking at performance-based tests and trying to move away from the, the density and the moisture content. They looked at a number of tests, uh, primarily driven by what what they call their vein shear test, which is the picture of it in the, in the top right hand corner. So they drive that into the pavement, with, or they slam it in with a hammer, um, and then they put a torque wrench on it and they measure the torque resistance of the material. Um, they've also been using a, a dynamic cone penetrometer to measure um, penetration resistance, getting some good information out of that. Do have some problems with, uh, you know, if you're, if you're going in a relatively thin layer, then you don't get too much information out of it. They're looking at a field marshal hammer for deformation resistance, so just banging that into the pavement, seeing how far it sinks in. Um, and with all of that information, they put out a provisional guideline 
for uh, emulsion-based CIR, um, which includes a test value for uh, opening to, to traffic. So some pretty good information coming out of that. This is part of the literature review, but taking a look at specifications. We did a lot of contacting of people and we found 84 agency specifications. So they were both state, county, uh, local authority. Uh, so on the map there, those are blue states, and then the grey states, so the blue states were, were specifications that we could find. Um, the grey states are specifications that did not um, provide us with any specifications. We're not saying they don't exist. We're basically saying is that despite repeated phone calls and, and pleads and, uh, and all the rest of it, uh, we could not get any information out of those, out of those states. From USA and Canada, 55% of those respondents had specifications for CIR. 15% for CCPR and 30% for uh, full depth reclamation. Uh, there was huge vari variation in those uh, specs. Um, straight, you know, from mix design, people had various ways of doing mix designs. They used Marshall, they used ITS, they used UCS. Uh, so a whole range of areas there. Um, the acceptance tests differed quite a bit, but primarily driven by um, density and, uh, and moisture content. And then a, a whole range of things but in terms of traffic opening and paving. Um, some guys were basing it purely on a time basis, you know, four hours you can open it, uh, seven days you can pave it. Some guys were saying drop to 50% moisture content before you, before you pave it. But a, a huge variety of, uh, of information out there. This is just a snapshot of, um, of the different acceptance tests. So you can see the sort of middle three high bars there, density, curing, and moisture content. That was kind of what was driving it. We see acceptance tests based on ITS. That's a problem because it takes a long time to do an ITS test. It's got to go through a curing phase and then you do wet and dry tests on it. So, you know, that can take anywhere up to five to six days. The project's usually finished before you get the test result. Marshall stability was out there. Um, test proof rolling. So running the water tanker up and down and seeing if it fell apart. Gradation, obviously also in there as well, making sure that we're, we're, we're not getting too much um, oversized material in the, um, in the project. We did a stakeholder survey as well, uh, ran through TRB committees, um, OSHTO subcommittees, um, Arrow were very helpful in, in getting it out as well. Coincidentally, we also got 84 survey responses from that. 74% were state and local, 10% academic, so a few institutions out there doing some research and they responded. Uh, unfortunately, we only got 16% and we know a lot of the industry folks are doing some really good stuff. They're not publishing it. Um, but they're developing procedures for actually doing better uh, QC, QA and, 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 and having a better understanding of what they're doing themselves. Unfortunately, only 16% of the respondents came from industry, so I think we're missing some information out there. A couple of summaries of those results. Uh, in terms of experience, so over 50% of the respondents had more than 10 years experience in in-place recycling. But, in, but interestingly, you know, 25 or you know, a quarter of the respondents that came back to us had less than two years experience. So obviously a, a, a big need for um, information out there. Work location, we got a pretty good distribution across the, the US and, and Canada. Some other interesting information, just experience with the recycling type. Um, so dark blue is foam and light blue is emulsion. On the left is full depth, middle CIR, and um, on the right CCPR. So you can basically see that most people have more experience with emulsion than they have with foam and experience with active fillers um, same colors there on the left cement in the middle lime on the right other uh, so you can see uh, cement definitely the most commonly used um, active filler out there there's also some interesting information just in terms of what was considered as a maximum acceptable turnaround time for any kind of test whether it be for opening to um, traffic or opening to paving um, you can see that most people believe that they wanted that information within a day. So that kind of excludes any kind of uh, indirect tensile or unconfined compressor strength testing. Dark blue is opening to traffic, light blue is, um, is time to surfacing. Uh, basically people want to turn around um, test um, preferably within four hours, but, uh, but um, one day would also be acceptable. And then some folks saying, well, you know, even up to 14 days would be great because that's probably only when we're going to do, be doing the paving anyway. Some of the challenges identified coming out of that um, stakeholder survey, general lack of experience out there, especially with the guys from the agencies that have to go out there and do that acceptance. So maintenance superintendents, uh, inspectors, REs, that sort of thing, being put onto projects and not having any understanding of what's good. 
Uh, we've certainly seen that in California. So basically what they do is they're so used to doing mill and full projects is they go out there and they take a look at a CIR. He's got hot mix asphalt in his brain and he takes a look at the material and says, I'm not happy with this. And you ask him, why is he not happy with it? You know, obviously they're trying to relate it back to hot mix asphalt. It's not black, it's not hot, it's not steaming, it's not compacted. All of those good things, um, they kind of just automatically decide that, that's, uh, that, that it's bad. Lack of appropriate QCQA tests obviously coming out of there saying, yeah, moisture and density is not telling us what we need to know. Some concerns about the excessive time before opening to surfacing and before opening to traffic and then surfacing. Uh, same sort of thing again, comparing it back to um, hot mix asphalt. The lack of specification and uniformity. So if there are local agencies that don't have specifications, then they look at states, they look at neighboring um, agencies, more national specifications, they're starting to see a huge variation and they're difficult to decide what's right and what's wrong. And then of course we always see it previously unsuccessful experiences. So no matter what goes wrong, no matter what they did wrong, it's always going to be the recycled layer that gets blamed. And, and we've certainly seen that. Unfortunately, not many people are going out and doing forensic investigations. So they see some cracking on the surface and they say, bah, layer was bad. But without going actually out and doing some investigations, they, uh, they're not actually understanding the performance. So we've fortunately in California, we've done a lot of forensic investigations, both good performing, poor performing. Uh, we have seen some failures out there or what were perceived as failures, but every single time it was a problem with the placement of the asphalt, nothing wrong with the uh, recycled layer or drainage. Okay, so folks not uh, sorting out drainage and we all know from Pavement Engineering 101 that you know, drainage is probably the most important thing that we've got to uh, take into consideration. There's some other stuff coming out of the stakeholder survey, as I said, driven by moisture content and density. There are some folks doing some <coughs> stiffness testing out there to see stiffness change over time. They tend not to do it for a very long period of time. Uh, so maybe, you know, in the first year after it, they'll go out there. Most of that testing being done with, uh, with a falling weight deflectometer. Moisture content, big driver. Folks are using nuclear gauge, um, a hot plate, uh, microwave oven, uh, normal oven. Uh, to try and come up with those with those numbers of course nuclear di uh, the nuclear gauge can be confused by the fact that you've got all that recycled material in there plus some new oil um, it's a hydrocarbon so that can influence the moisture content obviously most of that testing being driven by the fact that moisture plays a big role in it so again guys are getting hung up on is this hot mix asphalt um, you know you don't compact hot mix asphalt with water you don't cure hot mix asphalt with water but the guys will still try and box it into hot mix asphalt even though we're doing those processes. Some people are just saying it, measuring it in terms of time, um, other guys are actually going out there and, and doing a moisture content and relating that moisture content back to, uh, to when it can be done. So when we see for paving, for instance, a lot of states have in their specifications when it's 50% of the uh, compaction moisture content or the optimum moisture content, whichever one they're using, then that is a, a satisfactory time to be able to pay. Moving on to density, pretty much everybody's using nuke for that. We know that poor density will lead to um, you know, raveling, uh, densification, rutting under traffic. So density is a, a, a really important factor. And most people are doing it either to a relative lab density, so whatever they did in their mix design, or also based on an on a initial test strip or a test strip on the, on the start of each day uh, to look at what can be achieved and then, and then basing it on that. Uh, California also has a wet density test that they do in the field. Uh, we're seeing some major problems with that because it was developed for subgrade and, and base materials. There is some correlation to stiffness, um, but unfortunately it's only a snapshot. It doesn't give us a, a change in stiffness over time, which we are experiencing with traffic. So again, those measurements for stiffness, um, if it's for long-term performance, the, the agencies that are doing it are doing it with a falling weight deflectometer. Unfortunately, not a lot of, uh, of, of measurements over time. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to be able to measure some of our projects um, on, uh, we've got up to 17 years of, uh, of stiffness change data um, on some projects there that we've measured both at the beginning of the wet um, and dry season. So a lot of useful data are coming out of that. But in terms of project acceptance, uh, we've seen folks looking at lightweight deflectometer, uh, stiffness gauges, portable seismic pavement analyzers or the piece bar, clegg hammers, all those sorts of things. But generally they're great for the first day, 
um, anything after the first day, especially if you've got cement and lime in those materials, they tend to get out of range. Uh, most of these machines, the, the lightweight deflectometer can go up to about three gigapascals of stiffness, but you know, that, that we're typically achieving in the first day. Um, anything after that, you know, it's like any other instrument, it's going to give a number, but the number is, is usually garbage. You've got to be really careful with it. Some, we're still not 100% sure of what the zone of influence is. You know, how deep are these uh, devices giving us uh, measurements for? How, what effect does the underlying layers have on them? And also, you know, pretty useless once you've put the asphalt surfacing on that because they can't distinguish between the asphalt and the, um, and the recycled layer. Uh, from that stakeholder survey, just some of the other tests, uh, you know, some folks looking at um, bulk material properties, trying to come up with air void contents, uh, some folks using ground uh, penetrating radar for moisture, even some uh, time domain reflectometry requires instrumentation of the pavements, but th there was some uh, um, evidence of that. Uh, dynamic cone penetrometer, uh, field marshal, a couple of people have played around with that um, Utah, in addition to the work that Utah had done. Uh, proof rolling is quite a big concept, um, but no real guidance on it. Some guys using a 5,000 gallon tank, some guys using a 10,000 gallon tank. We didn't, weren't sure if the tank was full, whether it was empty, half full. Some raveling resistance, so we've got the uh, most common one is the what we call the F-150 test. So the guy sits in his truck, you know, turns the steering wheel left and right. Does that rip the material up or not? You know, whether you use a Ram, you use a 150, there could be some issues with that. Truck full, truck empty, all of those sorts of things. And then some more formalized, you know, ASTM um, rotating hose tests and that sort of thing. Abrasion resistance, studded wheel, some guys have looked at that um, as a potential. The cohesion, so slurry, slurry designs, can we adapt those tests? Always a concern that you know, if a test was developed for a specific purpose and you use it for something very different, you've got to be really careful with the parameters and understanding the numbers. As, as I tell my students, you know, no matter what test you do, it's going to spit out a number. Um, that number could of, course be, could of course be garbage, you've got to be really careful with it. Wire brush tests are the wet and dry um, cycle um, test for cement stabilization. We've looked at some adaptations of, of that, um, that has been reported. And then the emulsion sweep test as well um, for, for coming up with uh, some basic performance parameters. So all of those have been out there, a uh, wide range of, of experimentation. But again, when it comes down to the, to the nitty gritty, it's, uh, it's pretty much um, uh, moisture and, and density. So at the end of all of that, uh, put together a work plan to say, you know, what are we gonna look at in the, in the phase two? Um, so that was the table from the report. Uh, so density and compaction, um, it's really important to do that, but we need more. Uh, so looking at in situ moisture contents, um, various tests for that, we're looking at trying to make the best use of the nuclear gauge and the moisture probe. Raveling res resistance, looking at um, some kind of um, adaptation of laboratory tests that we can take out to the field, uh, you know, mount it onto the, onto the tow, uh, tow package of a, of a pickup truck and uh, and do some kind of raveling resistance on that. So we, we, we started with that. Um, stiffness to look at, you know, really to see whether the stabilization uh, mechanism has kicked in and we're getting curing of that. Uh, so we're looking at sto soil stiffness gauge, lightweight deflectometer, and the piece bar and the clegg hammer because we have that equipment available. In terms of shear, so this is moving more towards the opening to traffic. We're looking at the Utah vein shear test and some modifications of that. I'll, I'll touch on that uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, deformation resistance, um, either whether we can adapt the vein shear test for that as well. Uh, looking at field marshal or proctor hammer, just banging that into the pavement. Comp uh, vibrating compacting hammer to see if that, if we can use that. Uh, some information coming out of that. Proof rolling, obviously important. We can't do that in the laboratory, but uh, certainly trying to perfect uh, the mechanisms around that. And then for penetration resistance, again, either the modified vein shear process for that, or a dynamic cone penetrometer, or a device that I had some experience with when I still lived in South Africa was what we call a rapid control compaction device, which was something that was developed for trench reinstatements on pavements. It's kind of a simplified uh, dynamic cone penetrometer, but uh, much lighter weight. Okay, so let's take a look at where we are with phase two. Uh, so we have started on that. We're a little bit behind schedule because uh, most of this is being driven by uh, Virginia Transportation Research Council and uh, they had ordered a slab compactor to prepare slabs for the, um, uh, for the testing 
and uh, they had a delay in that equipment and, and getting it set up. But they have that now and we're, we're, we're kind of starting to fly. Uh, we collect mold or unstabilized materials. So this was where we got some contractors who were willing to put their recycling trains into the pavement and go forward at normal recycling speeds, not sit on one spot and just bounce up and give us pulverized materials, um, but actually run without any stabilizer in that um, and then send them down. We got that from six CIR projects, one uh, CCPR project and three FDR projects. Uh, I believe Brian is still looking for a couple more FDR projects uh, to come in there. But we have some good materials there that we can produce um, representative uh, specimens from. And those slabs are being prepared at, uh, at VTRC and we've started with the testing. Because we had the delay uh, back in uh, California, we started looking at this uh, vein shear test. So again, the idea is looking initial stiffness gain. Can we get information from that? Uh, so we're looking at the vein shear test plus the uh, LWD and the, and the um, stiffness gauge. Shear resistance opening to traffic, can we adapt the, uh, that vein shear test for that? And then the uh, raveling resistance, same thing. And then the shear resistance moisture content um, before we get into paving. So the, the devices that you see on, this, uh, on the slide there, the top one is basically the device that we looked at for uh, shear resistance, penetration resistance, deformation resistance, what we think a, a, a modification to the Utah device. And then the bottom one you see there is pretty much the same thing, but it's got much smaller pins, and that's for looking at the abrasion resistance. And this is kind of a, a more sophisticated conversion to the uh, F-150 test with uh, where you just uh, wiggle the steering wheel there. This is the Utah vein shear test, so we, we did try that banging it into the pavement but basically what we did is if you bang that in early in the life of the pavement when it's just you know straight after compaction um, out there uh, we tend to see what we see on the right hand side there is when you pull it out you actually do some destruction because it is quite a chunky piece of uh, material it's got a it's about a quarter inch steel you bang that into the pavement um, so with something that big you tend to have displacement and we don't want to create the situation that we're actually going to get a pothole in the um, in the surfacing. So we've looked at that, we use it as a benchmark because Utah are very happy with it. We went with a slightly different design with the, with the four pins instead of the single pin uh, to try and reduce the damage. So basically we've, we've designed it that you bang it in with a, with a stock standard Kessler DCP, the top end of a Kessler DCP, so we can count the blows, um, so we can kind of double it up as a penetration test. We can count the number of blows to get the pins into the pavement. We can then leave the weight on the top, so that's a counterweight. The Utah test, you kind of have to press down on, on it. And, you know, if I press down on it or Goliath presses down on it, it's kind of a different uh, situation. Um, so bang it in, the weight holds it in place, and then we put a torque wrench on that and, and measure the torque resistance on that. But the beauty of the new design or the design that we're following is when you pull it out of the pavement, it's non, essentially non-destructive. It leaves four holes in it, but it doesn't bulge the material. Uh, and create a pothole. So we're, we're, it's, it's giving us some, some good indications out there. We've tried it out on three projects because we've had some CIR projects happening fairly close to us uh, and we've been able to uh, take it out and, uh, and, and run it through the, through the process. LWD stiffness gauge, we've done a lot of um, collection of information out there, just building data. Um, primarily, we, we've, we've got some really good contractors in California that have been really helpful to us. They've allowed us to stay in their closures um, and do measurements on you know, literally an hourly basis and then a daily basis right up to the point that they've actually paved it, they've given us closure. So it's been fantastic to, to work with those guys. This is the rapid um, compaction control device, widely used in South Africa and I haven't seen it anywhere else. Although the United Nations used it for quality control on labor intensive projects in Afghanistan. So, you know, how about that? It has been used in a, in a couple of other places. So pretty simple device, spring loaded, you just uh, jack it up and, and twist the handle and it shoots a, a cone into the, into the pavement. Again, we've done those in combination with, uh, with all of the other tests out there. And it's got a measurement scale, but it also has a sort of red green device on this, you know, that area over there. So basically, you can twist that round, and uh, depending on the type of material that you're looking at, um, green is good, red is bad, means you need, um, it's not ready to go um, in that particular time. So we're trying that one out. Uh, it would be pretty easy to manufacture that and, and have that as some information as well. Quick overview of some California research. This is our, our center in California. 
Again, I'll, I'll use this side over here. So this is our facility, we've got trailers there. So this is our lab building, and then we have test tracks. So this is a composite pavement test track over here. This is the track where we've done most of our uh, in-place recycling research, and we've got some outside tracks here as well. We've done various overlay treatments on that, and then this one here is a, a permeable pavement track. Now this track here, it started off its life in 2010 as a warm mix asphalt project. Um, it's four lanes wide, uh, four standard lane wide, so we've got uh, lots of uh, testing space there. When we'd finished with the Warmex asphalt experiment, we, we brought in a recycling train and we did a full depth reclamation on that. Four lanes, we did one lane without any stabilizer, so it was just a, a reconstruction turning it into a, a base. Uh, we did one lane with emulsion, we did one lane with foam dashboard, and we did one lane with cement only. We beat that to death, wet and dry testing. Uh, then we put a bonded concrete overlay on it um, and did some testing on that. Now we're in the process of ripping the whole thing out right down to subgrade and then we're going to be putting a coal central plant recycle um, project into that area. So, so keep that in mind, that's where most of the, the work was done. So instrumented, we get a lot of information out of that. FWD before and after, stiffness measurements throughout. Um, we, we pull tons and tons of data out of that, out of that, um, that project. Okay, so in terms of our recycling, uh, we have a working for Caltrans, they're funding all of this research. Uh, we have a, what we call a recycling and sustainability strategic initiative. So it falls under that, um, looking at recycled materials. Uh, phase one, we completed this in 2008. It was focused um, on unstabilized materials and foamed asphalt materials, all with full depth, uh, comprehensive literature review, mechanistic sensitivity analysis, all of that good stuff. Started off our field performance measurements, we've been able to keep that going. Uh, so like I said, up to 17 years of, uh, of uh, stiffness change over time. Uh, we did some limited accelerated wheel load testing um, in that phase of the study. Did a comprehensive laboratory study, not only for mixed design, but also for um, doing triaxial testing to see if we can relate the laboratory testing back to what we were measuring in the field. With the, um, with the FWD. In terms of mixed design, you're saying, well, how much testing did you do? Uh, for that laboratory study in that phase one, we produced 4,437 specimens, I believe. Uh, so quite a few, we used eight tons of material. Uh, we used 125 five gallon buckets of, um, of, uh, of asphalt there. So we did some pretty serious um, testing and uh, when anybody argues with us, you know, we say, well, how, much, how many specimens did you produce for your, uh, for your testing. And, and out of that came preliminary guidelines and specifications for California and, and they were implemented with that. Um, phase two built on that, um, we, that was the test track where we did the four lanes and we continued the field testing, but we did some pretty serious accelerated load testing in there, both under wet and dry conditions and different temperature conditions on some of the foamed asphalt pro um, projects as well. Primarily here working towards ME design, California has its own mechanistic design system. They don't really like MEPDG because it's a black box. And if you have to start doing fudge factors on the um, uh, calibration factors to get the numbers you want to, that's not really mechanistic design. So they have their own system which has plug-in models. So you, know, you can plug in any models you want to. So develop, to develop models for that because we want to make sure that, that, that the um, recycled layers are are well designed. We have produced a guideline for that. It's under review right now. It's pretty comprehensive. Covers investigation, pavement design, mixed design, and, and construction. And in terms of the pavement design, it's both empirical and mechanistic, so depending on what way you want to do with that. And instead of using one-off um, numbers, so uh, Steve mentioned the range of layer coefficients that people use. We often see that people still do stick to 0 0.30 for, the, for CIR, for, existent, uh, for example. Uh, what we're trying to do is come up with a decision support system to say, well, you know, if, if you've got this, 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 and this, then you can use 0.38. If you've got this, 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 and this, then you should be using uh, 0.30. California also use a gravel equivalence design method. Uh, we're coming up with, uh, with a range of, of numbers for that. We also have done life cycle cost assessment. We've got that 17 years, up to 17 years of data for payments. Um, pretty good idea of that. So coming up with some pretty good uh, life cycle cost numbers. Um, environmental life cycle assessment numbers, we've, we've done with that as well. And then uh, working with the pavement management, Caltrans's pavement management system is actually coming with decision um, trees 
for the recycling to dictate where recycling would best be used. Mm -hmm. A lot of work going on there. One other thing we did was that Caltrans kept asking us, well, can we recycle a recycled layer? So once we had finished all of our test track uh, work on that section there, we got a recycler in. We didn't stabilize it, but we pushed the recycler through all four lanes uh, to see what kind of grading we could get out of, the, um, out of that material to see if we could get a, a representative grading for another recycle. And, uh, and yes, we can. Um, even with the fairly heavily cemented materials, um, where we just had cement, we still got a good grading out of that and we can certainly recycle it. Part of the space too as well we did, uh, you know, cement stabilization um, in full depth is, is, is quite popular in California, especially amongst uh, counties and cities because it is considered as, as inexpensive. It's not really, but, uh, but that's what they consider it. So again, looking at crack mitigation, so we had a separate test road there, uh, 36 different cells of crack mitigation approaches that we looked at with various cement contents and uh, pulled a whole lot of information out of there about understanding uh, cement treated layers and, and some of that was uh, was pretty surprising. Okay, quick look, that's our heavy vehicle simulator. So it's just a big frame, has a truck wheel that goes up and down. Uh, on a normal truck wheel, we can load up to two and a half times the legal limit. If we want to go above that, then we've got a Boeing 737 wheel that we can, that we can um, put onto it. So we can produce, we can get a lot of traffic data under controlled conditions in a very short period of time. Typical model that we use here, we can do 20 years of traffic in about three months. We can control temperature, so we can control the temperature of the pavement, we can make it hot or we can make it cold. Obviously we can't accelerate the climate, we can only accelerate the, the loading, but we can control the climate. And we can do it wet and we can do it dry. So this is the foamed asphalt um, experiment uh, after we'd done it. So it had two inches of AC, uh, standard hot mix asphalt on it. We had 10 inches of foamed asphalt, 8 inches of AB underneath that, and then a really, really bad subgrade. It had a uh, California bearing ratio of about 1.5. We put 34 million easels on that, okay, so pretty tidy traffic for 2 inches of asphalt, and 60% of the trafficking was done at 2.5 times the legal limit. Okay, so we were really overloading that pavement. Um, at the end of all of that, we wanted to carry on, but we couldn't because we were running out of money. We had six millimeters of rut and that was completely confined in the asphalt. There was nothing with the layer over there. So again, I'm going to use this side over here, but um, there, that's the cut with the, underneath the asphalt there. This is just saw cut here. Um, that's the, the foamed asphalt there and that's the asphalt base underneath there and you can see the clay underneath that. Basically, there was absolutely no distress in the, the foamed asphalt whatsoever. Um, and that was backed up with all of the FW and testing that we had done throughout the project. We did some wet testing as well. That failed. Fatigue cracking, serious. Everybody said, well, if, well we told you fatigue cracking. This stuff fails in fatigue cracking. So we opened it up. And so we pumped a lot of water into this, into this layer. It, it was really worst case scenario with water. Um, and again, this is the asphalt surfacing over here. And basically, we got a debond between the asphalt and the recycled layer. Uh, so the asphalt was working independently of the supporting layers underneath that. It did fatigue crack because the asphalt failed. But this again, the, you know, this had something like 18 million easels on it. It was wet, uh, but there was absolutely no distress, no rutting or anything in that underlying layer. The, the layer was still in perfectly good um, condition. So yeah, you could rip that surface off, put a new surfacing on it with a, good, with a decent tack coat and you'd, uh, you'd be just fine. And then finally, this is phase three. We're in the uh, CIR, CCPR phase right now. So we've done a lot of field testing. Um, the test track is being constructed as we speak. And then the, the basic deliverable out of that will be a, a still in an updated guideline with some better mechanistic properties for the, uh, for the CIR. Obviously, we're in, uh, doing that in conjunction with 9-62. Because uh, we're working on the same time, we'll be able to use our test track as a, as a further testing platform. Tell you some of the information that we have out there. Yeah, we, we are not good at, uh, at, at sharing our information outside of this. Yeah, we do have a website and everything is on that. So uh, we are working with, um, with ARA to, to try and make better use of, the, of all the information we've collected. Anybody got a question? You mentioned the failure mode was the um, lack of bonding between the cold in place and the hot mix asphalt surface. Are you recommending any type of tack or are people mainly just paving directly on cold in place? We've seen some, and I, that's a whole separate presentation, but we've seen some pretty poor uh, preparation of the surface. So we've seen some debonding related to that. 
but you know, if you have a good intact surface and you use a good tack coat on it, you, you, you're going to be fine. It's going to stick. We put an exorbitant amount of water into that, um, into that section. We actually drilled holes through the asphalt and pumped water um, into the underlying layer to see if we could get it to fail. So it was a worst case scenario. But that said is we have seen some failures associated with bad drainage in California on some full depth reclamation projects. And even when they came and dug it all out and replaced it with hot mix asphalt, the hot mix asphalt failed quicker than the foamed asphalt had failed. You know, drainage is still an important part. But I think, you know, sound pavement design, sound construction, good preparation of the surface, good tack coat, debonding shouldn't be a problem. What type of uh, tap, tack coat application rate are you looking at? Offhand, I can't tell you. I can look it up and, uh, and get back to you later. All right, thanks. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.